So this week we're going to focus on uh, the topic of fleeing from sin. And we really do need to flee from sin. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but not do what I say? Those are deep words from, from who we claim to be in and that who we follow, being Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So if he is the way, he is the truth, and he offers that eternal life. And he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, which so many people do, but don't do what he says? They're hypocrites. It's, it's purely a life which is not what he designed. So you're saying that you follow me, but you're not. I shared that you should do this, but you're not doing this. You're doing something else. And you justify it because somebody made it sound good, because somebody found a scripture that they could use to justify whatever that teaching is. But if it counters what Jesus said, it's never good. I don't care how hard people work to justify something. So as you see here, it says run and don't look back. We need to flee from sin when we recognize something is sin, when we are convicted that that should not be a part of my life, that the Lord has said, I don't want you to have this as part of your life. Who you knows best for us? And so if we're really truly seeking to live spiritually, supernaturally, following Jesus, sin just isn't worth it. It's not worth that second look, that little, oh, okay, you, you get tempted, and then you take that next step, and then you sin. Well, everyone will say the truth. It's hard not to sin, and that is truth. It's hard not to sin. Why? Because we were born and raised into a world that's sin-based, that follows its own system, that's based on sin, and that influences everyone around us, that sin, even if it's not okay, it doesn't say it's okay, but what's it gonna really do? And why do you buck the system? Why are you trying to be different? Why are you trying to make others uncomfortable? And if they can neutralize you by doing that, but if you remember the parable of the sower, Jesus said the first seeds, they, they fell on the path and um, the birds came and they grabbed them away. And that's uh, when Satan snatches it out of the heart of somebody who listened to it, but didn't understand it. So it doesn't take root. But the second case was when it fell on the rocky ground and it took root and it grew up and it started to show itself. And then because of persecution, Jesus said, because of his namesake, because of the gospel, that people would then become embarrassed or would then tend to flee away from it because it separated them from their friends in this world and they would flee. And this is the case that we're looking at that happens whenever we're around people and we share something and they start to really receive it but others come behind us, which is the way of the adversary, and will cause them to feel uncomfortable and immediately will fall away from the truth that initially took root. But now, as it says in the parable, the sun came up and it burned brightly and they didn't have a root that was deep enough and they wilted. And the, therefore they could never grow. And so when we think about sin, uh, I'm going to start with what it says in 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. The, the Apostle John says, And this is the message that we have heard from him, being Jesus, and announced to you, meaning everyone in the world. God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. None. Absolutely no darkness in God. If we say that we have fellowship with him, so now we're proclaiming that we're in Christ. Now we're proclaiming that we're following Jesus. And if we say this, we walk in darkness, that's the way of the world. Then we lie, but we do not practice the truth. Now, the word practice is so key because when you want to be good at something, you practice it. 
or if all of your friends are doing something and that's the new fad and you want to be like your friends, you might not even like what you're doing, but you want to be accepted. So what do you do? You practice. Today, there's video games. In the past, there were different sports or juggling or whatever, and that you would participate in and practice so that you could master it. Therefore, you knew that you would then be acceptable to the clique or the clan or whoever it was that you were practicing it to be part of right here. Are we practicing something that allows us to exist or coexist in the darkness in this world? And many people are. They like to practice religion. They like to practice what we call today Christianity because it allows them to have one foot in and one foot out. They say they're following Christ, but really they're practicing the things everyone else does that is acceptable. The world accepts that because, okay, we're going to have religious people. But if somebody really is following Jesus and they're so different from the world, they're no longer practicing what we want them to practice, the world says. And that's when persecution sets in. That's when we start to feel the pinch that Jesus had to live whenever he was opposed by this world and its system, by religious leaders, by religious rulers, by the law of the people, their doctrines, that they were trying to alienate Jesus because he wasn't going with the program. And so, as it says, that if we say we have fellowship with Jesus, yet we walk in darkness, the way of this world, we actually lie, and we're not practicing the truth. Now, Jesus is the only person who can offer us the truth, pure, unadulterated, the pure truth. But if we walk in the light, following him as he is in the light, well, then we will have fellowship with one another. Well, who are the one another? It can't be the people in this world. It's got to be with people who also are walking in the light. So therefore, if you're trying to fellowship with someone who's truly not walking in the light, they just appear to be, you're not going to be able to have fellowship with them because they're not walking in the light. They're actually practicing something other than the truth. So it's very difficult if we go and search for people to fellowship with who are walking in the light. Jesus said, I will supply all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And so if Jesus said that he would supply all of our needs according to his riches, and we're seeking true spiritual fellowship with people who are truly following Jesus, he will provide that. And he has provided that in the lives of all those who truly seek this by, from the Lord. And so he says, if we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, then cleanses us from all sin because we're walking in righteousness, not in the way of the world. Now, if we say we have no sin, which a lot of people say, no, I, I'm not a sinner. I, Jesus took all my sins away and I, I don't sin. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Because if we have the truth living in us, we know that, that truth will convict us when we do something that is other than what the Lord would want us to do. And anytime we do something that is outside of what we know we should do, that is sin. And so that's how we grow in Christ. But many people walk around like, like whitewashed tombs. They're dead inside, but they can say, I'm not a sinner anymore. And the Lord took all my sins away. And that's true. He did. If you truly committed to Jesus, he took all your sins away. It says he did the lady who was brought before him who was caught in adultery. And what did he tell her? All your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. Meaning don't keep practicing sin. Because those sins haven't been forgiven. I've forgiven you up to this point. The cripple who he, he healed he said, hey, go and sin no more. Something worth will happen to you. So he was telling him, all your sins have been forgiven. But don't sin anymore because something worse will happen to you. 
And yet we have all these people who believe, oh, I had all my sins forgiven in one prayer. And they go on living their lives however they want to, thinking, thinking a lie, not the truth, thinking that they have nothing to worry about. That's how can you possibly spiritually grow if you've got nothing to worry about? There's no reason, there's no motivation to want to worry about growing. Those who are truly in Christ, we know the difference. We know that well, I know when I shouldn't have done that. I know I should have done this and I didn't do it. That's when we're convicted by the Holy Spirit. And that's when we're shaped by the potter, when we are the clay, allowing him to shape us how he wants to. He wants us to be. So if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's the key. Jesus said, go and sin no more. But if you do sin, you have a free right peace that's right here. If your heart's in the right place, you'll come. You'll ask for forgiveness. You confess your sin instead of pretending that you're not a sinner. And if you do, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, legal, legalistic churches will tell you, oh, my gosh, you've got to go and do this and this and this in order to get your life right with Christ. But Jesus would just simply say, come to me with a true heart and I will forgive you. Now, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. Why would we do this? Because this is the way of the world. This is another ploy of the adversary that we would say, I don't sin, but we make him, Jesus, out to be a liar. And if that's the case, his words is not in us. We're not following him. We don't have the truth. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, it states, for God, he hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. Now, what is self-control if it's not us finding that we didn't do something just like when we're practicing anything? Say we're practicing to learn how to juggle and we keep dropping the ball, but we're persistent. We keep going and going until now I can do it longer and do it longer. Now I can throw another ball in and we can do it better because we've learned to have self-control, to be persistent in the things that we're practicing and we are to be practicing righteousness. We aren't to be avoiding the fact that we've sinned, but we should be accepting the fact that we sinned so that we can practice, so that we can become closer to being like Christ, who was sinless. He was sin free. John also wrote in 1 John 3, 4 through 10, everyone who practices sin practices lawlessness as well. In other words, they're just going to be able to do anything. And many people live this way. They practice sin. Indeed, sin is lawlessness. But you know that Christ appeared to take away sins. And in him, but well, we know there is no sin. So we need to seek to be in him and strive to be perfect. Like your heavenly father is perfect. Those words came from Jesus. No one who remains in him. Now, key word here, no one who remains in him. Because many people just as the seeds that were planted by the sower sprung up through roots were in him, were growing. They didn't remain in him. But he said anyone who remains in him keeps on sinning. No one who remains in him can keep on sinning. Could we do that? We're convicted by the Holy Spirit to tell us that's wrong. You sinned against God. Well, if we're neglecting to believe that we have any sin, we go on sinning and we'll practice sin. No one who continues to sin has seen him or know him. Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as Christ is righteous. The one who practices sin, well, they are of the devil. Because the devil has been sinning from the very start. 
This is why the Son of God was revealed. This is why the Son of God was revealed, because of sin, to destroy the works of the devil, because the devil brought sin from Eve and Adam, and Jesus came to abolish, destroy the works of the devil, which is sin. No one born of God refuses to practice sin. If we're in Christ, we will refuse to practice sin. We'll be uncomfortable. We couldn't live with ourselves because we know that we're sinning against our Holy Lord, the, the very spirit that lives within us. Because God's seed abides in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. By this, the children of God are distinguished from the children of the devil. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. Now, what, the, what does the world equate to righteousness? I go to church, I read my Bible, I say my prayers, I talk about Jesus, I wear hats and shirts that say something about the Lord, and that is practicing righteousness. That's not what Jesus said practicing righteousness is. It's to practice a non-sinful life. That means you can do all those things on the outside, and you can do all those things as a practice, but you could also go on sinning. But he says, I want you to practice not sinning. That's righteousness. Not following some rules or being part of a, um, a society that does certain norms that make you all feel like you're doing something for God. No. Practice righteousness means that you are practicing not to sin. And anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. And how many people will judge someone else to a point where they won't even be around? Well, that's not righteousness. And that is not what Jesus taught. John continues in 1 John 5, 18 and 19. He tells us, we know that anyone who is born of God does not keep on sinning. The one who was born of God protects him. And the evil one cannot touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world is under the power of the evil one. There's a remnant, a small bit, who is actually qualified to be considered righteous. But everyone else, we know that the whole world is under the power of the evil one. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 in 27, it warns, you know, if we deliberately go on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, after we've been planted and the root is taken, no further sacrifice for sin remains, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume all adversaries. That goes on to talk about how you used to need two or three witnesses, and you could just take somebody under the law, and you could have them stoned to death. How much worse will it be for those who have tasted the Spirit of God and trampled on it because they didn't practice righteousness? They practice sin. First John 4 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. There's a lot of spirits out there. The churches are filled with them. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. They're all around us. The whole world is filled with sin. Why would we be so foolish to think, not today, that was back then? In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10, it clearly states, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral and boy, there are many, nor idolaters, and that anything that you put, that you treasure in your life to where God becomes second is idolatry. Nor will idolaters, nor adulterers, that's okay, I'm living for God when others are looking, but on my own, oh, I'm committing adultery in this world. And it could be sexual, 
be just from the heart, nor men who submit to or perform homosexual acts. And all this talk now about how we should love the homosexual, there's nothing wrong with loving the homosexual because you love any sinner. But don't love the sin. And no, don't say that the sin is okay just because God is love. Nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor verbal abusers. People who sit around and got nothing better to do than gossip or point at people and make fun of them and, and belittle other people. Nor swindlers, people who like to, oh, I got one up on that person, who like to, to one up other people and swindle them. None of them will inherit the kingdom of God. They just won't. Why? Because if you're doing any of those things, you are not practicing righteousness. I don't care how many times you go to church and read your Bible and say your prayers. But if you do any of those things, you are practicing sin. Therefore, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 5 through 6 tells us, examine yourselves to see Brother, you are in the faith. I, I wish that more people would take this to heart. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Can't you see for yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless you actually fail the test. And I hope you will realize that we have not failed the test. Those who are in Christ will, I know I'm in Christ. And what will validate that will be their life in righteousness, not by what they do outwardly, but by what's happened inwardly. Matthew chapter 9, verse 10 through 13, it says, Later, as Jesus was dining at Matthew's house, after he had asked him to follow me, that was Jesus looked at Levi, Matthew, and said, follow me. And he dropped everything to follow him. Well, later he invited him to dinner at his house. Matthew was moved by the power of the Holy Spirit. He was a convert. He chose to follow Jesus and leave everything in this world. So he invited him over. And you know, Jesus takes us just the way we are. Matthew hadn't had time to grow spiritually. So he naturally would get together with his friends at his house and that's what he was doing. And he invited Jesus, who was now his new friend, to come over and partake with him. Many tax collectors and sinners came and they ate with him and his disciples. So now they were carousing with sinners, according to those who like to look good on the outside would say. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Questioning Jesus. On hearing this, Jesus said, you know, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. He was talking about, it's not those who make themselves look good on the outside and think they're righteous, because they don't need a doctor. No, I'm okay. I'm okay, you're okay, we're good. So they don't need a doctor, because they don't believe they need a doctor. So they don't need a doctor. But he said the sick do. Then he told them, but go and learn what this means. They desire mercy, not sacrifice. Wow. Heavy words. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Well, it's almost a contradiction. Unless you understand what Jesus is saying, he's with sinners. These righteous, in their own minds, religious people came to him and were judging him. He said, no, you're well, I don't need to talk to you. You're the righteous ones. You've already said it. And because you said it, you're not going to be righteous at all. But I came for those who are sick, who are sinners. He got this from Hosea chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, quoting, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Now we can understand the context of what Jesus was saying. I desire mercy which is the forgiveness of sin because of a heart change, because of a repentance and a turning away from this world, not sacrifice, a religious mindset. I do this on Sunday and I go and do this and I go and do that. I'm doing all these things for God. 
That's sacrifice. I'm sacrificing my time today. I could be doing other things, but I'm I'm tithing my time to God today. Wow. So far from the truth. Not practicing righteousness. Practicing self-righteousness. Yes. So if you're already so self-righteous, well, I didn't come for people like that. I came for those who realize that they are separated from God, that they are sick, the sinner, the tax collector. And it goes on to say, but they, like Adam, have transgressed the covenant. They've broken my law. There they will be were the unfaithful to me. There they are, the unfaithful to me. So Jesus was blatantly telling these religious leaders, you are unfaithful to God. You are unfaithful. Even though you do all these things, look at you judging these people who are opening their hearts to the truth when you yourselves are closed to the truth. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6, Paul wrote, Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from any brother who leads an undisciplined life that is not in keeping with the tradition that you received from us. So now he's talking about those who are at least claiming to be in Christ and are recognized as a brother in Christ. If they are living an undisciplined life, meaning that they are not practicing righteousness, keep away from them. They're not keeping with what was taught to you, what we taught you from the good news, from the gospel. Keep away from them. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, it tells us, but now I am writing you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, or a verbal abuser, or a drunkard, or a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. So somebody's claiming they are righteous, but yet they live a worldly life don't associate with them. This creates a ripple in the lives for those who are truly following Christ. Because if you associate with them, you will be considered and associated in the minds of those who see you associate with them. So let's look at the case where Jesus was sitting with sinners. And what did the religious minded people say? Oh, what are you, a fool? that you would go and sit with these people who we don't even go near. But Jesus said, those are the people who have a heart to know the truth. When you yourselves live deceived, religious, pious, unrighteous, self-righteous lives. Well, Paul wrote not only to the church in Thessalonica, but to the church in Corinth, don't even associate with people who practice these things, who live this way, who are churchianity type people, who just are the big names in church, but boy, they practice sin. But they don't want anybody to know. But even if you find out, well, you know, God will forgive them. Don't associate with them. That's what Paul was saying. In Proverbs 28, verses 9 to 14, it advises us this. Whoever turns his ear away from from hearing the law, even his prayer is detestable. Now, what is the law that those who are in Christ are following? That we are putting God first always in our lives every day and that we are loving others as we love ourselves. But anyone who turns his ear away from that, who puts something else before God in their lives, even his prayer is detestable. He who leads the upright along the path of evil will fall into his own pit. How many people out there who are man-made pastors, teachers, elders, leaders in what's called the church are leading others that would be upright along a path of evil? They'll end up falling in his own pit. But the blameless they will inherit what is good. A rich man is wise in his own eyes. Oh, yeah, look at me. I've become wealthy. I've got this swindling scheme and I've made all this money. But a poor man with discernment sees right through this person. 
That's what the Lord desires of us, that we see through these schemes, these schemes to, to draw people in and, and to gain fame and recognition, to allow people to practice a life that's acceptable to those people. And they've surrendered an opportunity instead of their lives to follow Jesus. They are now surrendering to the way of this world. And don't do it. It's detestable. The blameless will inherit what is good. When the righteous triumph, there is a great glory. But when the wicked rise, men hide themselves because they don't want to be the next target for that person. He who conceals his sins will not prosper. This is the person who says, I don't sin. I'm living for God. Remember, he who says they were without sin are a liar. But whoever confesses and renounces them, they will find mercy. Blessed is the man who is always reverent, reveres God, reveres their place in Christ. But he who hardens his heart falls into trouble. This is the problem with mankind. How many times did Jesus say, you who have hardened hearts, you who have ears that cannot hear and eyes that cannot see, blessed is the man who always is reverent. Blessed were those tax collectors and sinners that were in the midst of Jesus because they were able to hear the truth. In Revelation chapter two, verses one through five, it says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. This is a reference to seven signified churches that um, we know in the revelation that, that was given from Jesus to John that he wrote down, that the seven lampstands were the seven churches. I know your deeds, your labor, and your perseverance, which is what God demands of us. I know that you cannot tolerate those who are evil. You don't even want to be around them. And you have tested and exposed as liars, those who falsely claim to be apostles. This is exactly what we were looking at earlier, that there are many who have gone out among us who are of the world and are false prophets and false teachers and false apostles. And it goes on, it says, without growing weary, you have persevered and endured many things for the sake of my name. But I have this against you. You have abandoned your first love. Remember, God is love, and we are to put God first. That's our first love, is that we chose to put God first in our life no matter what, even though we didn't understand it. That was faith. But you've abandoned that. Therefore, keep in mind how far you have fallen. You live as the world lives. Yeah, you've done all these other things, but you are no longer putting God first in your lives. You have fallen. Therefore, repent and perform the deeds that you first did when you just were fully committed to following Christ. But if you do not repent, that means turn away from your life the way it is now. I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, meaning you'll have no place with the Lord. Those are heavy words. Those are from Jesus. And they were they were shared for all of us to embrace. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, it tells us, do you not know that a race, that in a race, all the runners run? The gun goes and everybody in a race is running. Everyone's running. But only one receives the prize, first place. Only one. All these people. It's it's a, probably no irony that now I'm recalling that um, in a, just a marathon last week, I believe, that they had a race. And they all these people who are world-class runners chose to hold back and not win the race so that for political reasons, 
a Chinaman who was running could win first place. Well, then a couple of days later, it came out and they proved that all those people needed to let the other person win. And when they did, guess what? They removed not just the guy who, who won the race. They didn't just take his trophy. They took the trophies from all those others who colluded with him to let him win. So it comes as no surprise. Everyone's running to receive the prize. So it says run in such a way as to take the prize. Don't let somebody else win. Take the prize. This is your prize. You would have to have enough zeal to run after Christ. So run in a way to take the prize. Everyone who competes in the games, they train. Uh, they train with strict discipline. This is practicing. They practice to win. They do it for a crown. And this crown that they're going to win is first of all for talking about the games. But we, we do it for a crown that's imperishable. For eternal life with Christ, we persevere to the end, no matter how tired we are, no matter how much we ate, no matter how much the other runners are running next to us and causing us to feel pressed in. We keep running as though we want that prize. That's perseverance. Therefore, I do not run aimlessly, Paul said. I don't fight like I'm beating the air. No. I discipline my body and I make it my slave instead of me, my body's slave, to fulfill the desires of this world. No. Discipline my body and make it my slave. So that after I have preached to others and shared the good news of the gospel, that I myself will not be disqualified. But why did Paul say that you could be disqualified if you could not be disqualified? And so we need to run the race and persevere to the end and do so so that we won't be disqualified, so that we will win the prize. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14, Paul states, not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect. Remember, we're striving towards that, but we haven't made that. But I press on to take hold of that from which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, what I've done that I didn't want to do and what I didn't do that I wanted to do, forgetting that and straining towards what is ahead, the prize, eternal life in Christ. I press on toward the goal to win the prize of God's heavenly calling in Christ Jesus. I just heard something this week where the pastor was teaching. We don't have to struggle and drive anymore because Christ has done all the work. When he forgave us for our sins, we, we are sinless. And we're going to go into heaven because he said so. I couldn't help but think, but what about the truth? What about what Jesus taught? What about what Paul wrote? No, these things sound good, and they keep people in the seats. They keep congregations coming back because people like to hear what they want to hear. And we know the scriptures tell us that in the last days, people will gather around themselves teachers that will tickle their ears, that will teach them what makes them feel good. But we don't want that. We want the truth. Because anything short of the truth, we win no prize. We may feel comfortable today. We may feel good. But in the end, we will suffer for eternity for listening to a lie, for living a lie. That's what Jesus taught. In James chapter 4, verses 5 through 10, we read, Or do you think the scripture says without reason that the spirit who caused to dwell in us, meaning the spirit of Jesus, yearns with envy? What do you think that spirit envies? 
our heart's desire. What is our heart's desire? What do we treasure? But he gives us more grace. This is why it says God opposes the proud, the person who says, I already got there. I'm good to go. I don't have to run anymore. I can hold to that. But gives grace to the humble. Wow, I hope I'm running well, Lord. I'm being the faith. I'm striving toward you. I'm seeking that you would forgive me of all that's unclean in my life. Help me, grow me, cause me to move forward so that my life can be a reflection to others so they can see the truth and that they too can come to know you. That is what we strive for. When God opposes the proud, he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit yourselves then to God. Submit to him. Resist the devil. Who's going to try to draw you into all of these false teachings, all of this worldly stuff that waters down the truth of the Lord? Resist the devil. And the devil will flee from you, won't know what to do, because your heart is sold out to God. Draw near to God, draw near to him, and he will draw near to you. What great news that is for us, that if we draw nearer to him, he draws nearer to us. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and weep. Turn your laughter into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord. And guess what? If you do, he will exalt you. We want the world to exalt us. We want people to recognize when we did something for them. Did you notice I did that for you? Oh, yes. Oh, thank you for doing it. And we've received our prize. But when are we going to learn that we don't need the recognition or approval of another? just of God, but we need his recognition. When will we revere him to a point where it doesn't matter if man says this or that, it does not matter because is God pleased with my life? Is all we should be concerned with. Finally, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 13 and 14, it says, no temptation hath seized you except what is common to man. We are all tempted. We are all going to fall. But no temptation is going to seize you that is uncommon. It's common to man. If we lie and we say, oh, I'm not tempted, we can do that, and a lot of people do, because they don't want to reveal the truth. And those people live in a very, very distraught way internally, because they have not faced the truth, the fact that, they need to be cleansed. Their hearts need to be cleansed. And it goes on to say, and God is faithful. God is faithful. Mankind will fail us. We'll fail ourselves. But God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Sometimes we don't have the faith to believe that. And we fall prey to the sin anyway. Not because we're naive, maybe the first time, Maybe even the second time, because we were naive. But the third time? No, we're not naive. We know better. We're just weak, spiritually weak. And we need to gain self-control in that area. And we do that by growing stronger, drawing nearer to Christ, who will draw nearer to us. But when you are tempted, he will also provide an escape. So don't think that you're trapped and there's nowhere for you to go. But which do we desire more, the escape or the pleasure? Whatever it was that was tempting us. But he'll provide an escape so that you can stand under the temptation. You can withstand it. That's scripture. That's truth. That's not taught in that context in most ways. In fact, well, you don't, you don't worry. Don't beat yourself up over sin. Christ already died for all your sins. He did. And when he forgave that, that uh, crippled, he forgave all of his sins. But then he said, don't go and sin anymore because something worse may happen to you. So Jesus didn't give a free ticket and say, doesn't matter what you do with the rest of your life. Now that I've healed you, you're good to go. I forgave all your sins. 
That's a fallacy. That's a fake. That's a lie from Satan. That's not what Jesus taught. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. It's interesting the way that James put that right after he was talking about sin. Because idolatry is defined as treasuring anything above God. It's an idol. Anything you put in front of God. So think about your own life. What causes you to sin? Typically, it's something that in your heart you've treasured at that moment, at that time of temptation. And when you fall into it, it's because you treasured it above God. He says flee from that, flee from idolatry. Easier said than done. That's why we need to keep our eyes focused on Christ. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, doing the right thing, being sin free. Asking for forgiveness when we fall. Cleansing our hearts. So we need to flee from sin. Sin will chase us. The adversary roams around like a roaring lion looking for who he might come after. The world will tempt us with all kinds of things. Flee from sin. Run. Don't look back. The second look isn't worth it. Because Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but not do what I say? This is the problem. This is the problem in our own lives that has to be solved supernaturally, spiritually, not through religion, not for us sacrificing, because God loves mercy more than sacrifice. And his mercy is upon us if we seek him for forgiveness to cleanse us from unrighteousness, because he desires that we live a righteous life. And those are the things that the Lord put on my heart this week concerning fleeing from sin.